You're listening to Art Affairs, episode number 20. Today I'll be talking to Faith47. So my name is Michael Faith, and this is Art Affairs. If this is your first time listening, Art Affairs is meant to give you a look at and into the new contemporary art community, featuring conversations with artists, gallerists, curators, shining a spotlight on the human side of the wonderful work they do. You can dig through previous episodes complete with show notes at artaffairspodcast.com, and you can check out new episodes on all your favorite podcast platforms. Of course, if you like what I'm doing here, be sure to subscribe. And you can always connect with the show on Instagram and Facebook at Art Affairs Podcast. All right, so today's guest is artist Faith47. Faith is a world-renowned street and studio artist who's painted works in 39 different countries and who served for a long time as a model for feminine strength in what has historically been a male-dominated community. We talk about the role of feminism in her work on the show, as well as how she got started painting graffiti in the streets of South Africa, her upcoming solo show at Everard Reed Gallery, and a whole lot more. And just a reminder, I do usually wrap these shows up with some closing remarks, sort of reflecting on our chat and and summing up my feelings on it. So, you know, maybe stick around after the interview to check that out. Uh, With that said, I hope you enjoy my conversation with Faith47. Faith, welcome to the show. It's it's so good to have you on. Thanks. Yeah, it's really it's really awesome to meet you, and um, I'm excited to chat. All right, awesome. So let's let's dive into your background a little bit. Um, and and so you know you were born and grew up in in Cape Town, South Africa, and Cape Town seems like a pretty urban environment, just from my perception of it out, outside. What was the area like where you grew up? Yeah, Cape Town is a city that's based in the middle of like quite incredible nature so you're surrounded by beaches and mountains and just gorgeous um, natural landscapes Uh, the city itself is um, very segregated uh, racially and and geographically um, the way that it was uh, designed you know and so it has a lot of um, like really rich areas, really poor areas, and it's all quite zoned. So it, it it looks really beautiful as a tourist when you go there. It has a lot of tourism and like it's aesthetically like gorgeous. Um but it has like a lot of um issues that if you live there you you kind of get to know more in depth. Mm. So so the the I guess the tourist facade is more or less a facade, right? And there's there's a lot of like underlying issues that you saw? There's a lot of underlying issues. I mean, the nature is real, and it really is something that I um, deeply appreciate and influenced me a lot growing up. Um, but yeah, it's a very, um, I see it as a kind of uh, microcosm of the macrocosm in terms of um, in South Africa, you have um, a lot of the issues that the world has, but it's all like very condensed in one small space so you're kind of faced with it every day whereas um in the world you could live in europe or like you know switzerland that would be quite oblivious to what's happening elsewhere or you could live in like el salvador or or a place where it's kind of really harsh and i feel like south africa is one of those places where you have that kind of contrast of living experience but it's in one condensed um, place so in that way it's 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 been kind of an honor to to live there just to have that um perception of the world mm. and, and and timing wise when you were growing up that was right at the tail end of apartheid right you sort of experienced on both sides of that um as a kid was that something that you felt the weight of when you were growing up or was it something you became more aware of as as you got older 
Right. So it's something I reflected on a lot in my life. And, um, you know, when we were kids, we were quite oblivious to it in some ways. Uh, my mother was like a single mother and she, you know, she brought us up with uh, like kind of natural surroundings as much as possible. We would go hiking and camping and stuff like that. So we had a really good rooted um, life in the with nature and then um we you know we she's super liberal and that we had a lot of friends from different neighborhoods and like so I wasn't personally very aware of it but I do remember you know my I was in primary school when the system when the government changed like slowly the model c schools started coming in and um yeah we we still were um in the old apartheid education system and I do remember my teachers making racist jokes and that was kind of normal um, and seeing the whites only signs I remember that the trains were segregated I remember um, asking my grandmother like why why you had the first and third class like why was it you know the first class was these nice cushy leather seats and in the third class everyone was like really crammed in together sitting on wooden benches and stuff so I remember going the beaches were all for white people I remember that stuff you know but then when I talk to my peers who grew up in black neighborhoods their memories are much more uh, vicious of um like tear gas or like the, the Casper cars that would come in so or uncles that were put in prison and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, um, sheltered in some ways, I guess. But, um, yeah, I think um, I only really became more um, aware of it, like, as I was growing up, you know. And, and ended up seeing both sides of it, I guess, because you, you were only seeing one side of it for a while. Yeah, I mean... Um, what can I say? I remember we, my sister and I, you know, we were, like living below the line we weren't like white middle class suburban we were kind of just a little below the line because as I said my mom was like a single mother and that so we caught the trains to school and uh, I think that had a heavy impact on me because uh, well my sister and I as soon as the, as soon as the train system changed from um, from um, like whites only and, and non-white carriages like we were like one of the first to be um, traveling on the on third class when they opened it up and you know we were we'd do things like that where we were like it wasn't quite acceptable almost and people didn't know what to do and they were like get off the get off this train you're supposed to be on the other side and stuff like that and we'd be like no we want to we want to like um we want to experience this differently you know and we were young then like we didn't really um know what was really happening but um those experiences of just being on the trains and like um also seeing a lot of the political slogans from the time like the old stencils and slogans that were still up um, from the apartheid era like I got to see those also some I remember seeing some early crass like the punk band crass stencils before I knew who crass was um, and it was like um, fight war not wars fight power not people you know and a lot of the old solidarity apartheid stencils and and those influenced me I remember just like being really intrigued by them um, and I think that did inform some of my work when I kind of got more into uh, public art. Sure, yeah. Um, and, and you mentioned your your mother being a single mother. What kind of work did she do? My mother, you know, she's a physiotherapist. Uh, she's an uh, acupuncturist. She does uh, Chinese traditional medicine, qigong. She's she's a healer. I would say she's a healer. She's quite a like a spiritual person. She's very grounded. Okay. And, and as a kid, were you interested in the arts at all? Or was that something you kind of came into as you became a teenager and got into the graffiti scene? You know, I wanted to be a um, nature conservationist for a very long time. I wanted to work with animals and I still do. There's, it's something that I, I'm still interested in figuring out how to perhaps like go in that direction. But even with my art, maybe being more involved in some conservation, um, like activism. the the art came in because, okay, so I was um, was in high school. I was pretty rebellious. We were kind of dysfunctional. Like, 
you know, sneaking out the house, going to nightclubs, like really naughty. I mean, that's a, like a regular teenager. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe a little more than regular. My sister and I were pretty like uh, dangerous. We, um, it was, uh, it was a really interesting time because it was the end of apart the apartheid era and there was this like visceral electricity in the air, but people like it was really, um, exciting. Like there was this positivity, this idea that like, um, things were going to change, you know, there was like a hopeful feeling. I really feel that. Um, and we were like super young at that time and just like exploring. And, and I was, um, going to this kind of very, um, uh, old, old white school, you know, like suburban white school. And I think I really didn't fit in there. Um, I, my first boyfriend when I was about 15 died in a, a hit and run accident and we were all there with him. Wow. So we had this kind of really emotional, Tra uh, traumatic uh, event and I, I think what happened and I've reflected on this a lot was that I was just like really had a lot of angst and so when I met um, Wheels uh, and when I, I kind of was moving within the skateboarder kind of punk rock kind of circles at that time too and uh, w when I met Wheels and he was doing all this graffiti stuff that was interesting to me because it was this kind of um, subversive movement that was, you know, people going out at nighttime. Like it was exciting and also kind of like uh, anti status quo kind of thing. So that appealed to me, and I started um, I started going out with them, and you know, I also felt pregnant at that point, so um, it was just a big whirlwind. But I was. Um, How did you first meet Wheels and get involved in the community? Yeah, well, he's a skateboarder. And so, um, at that time, I was friends with a lot of the skateboarders and that. So I guess we had a, um, my mom went away for the weekend. I remember we had a house party at one point. <laughs> <laughs> no, anyway, uh, no, we just met. I, I don't know. Um, and yeah, he kind of schooled me. He schooled me. Um, and what happened? Yeah, you know, we have my son. We we're both very young. We we're living with my mom. And I, um, after about three years, I was like very, very frustrated and kind of claustrophobic. Um, my mother said to me, look, you know, uh, you're not handling, like, if you want to go and find yourself for a few months, go and come back. So I saved up all the money I had and, um, went to England for, to London for six months and, uh, was, um, kind of doing night shift work at Disney, like regretting DVD covers and things like that. And oh, wow. um, I was hanging out with a lot of the graffiti people there. Uh, you know, I met like Insa and Solo One was schooling me quite a lot. So I came back to Cape Town really inspired and like feeling like I could do anything, you know, like really like motivated. And um, at the time, um, you know, it was kind of hard because a lot of the guys wouldn't really paint with me or take me seriously. And, um, I had a, a girlfriend that I lived with. And so we would go out together, just the two of us and just go and like, you know, it's kind of really irresponsible, but, uh, we had a great time and I did do a lot of, um, like illegal freeway stuff and that back then. And I think I kind of earned my stripes at that point, you know, <laughs> Well, you you mentioned um, you know the birth of your son, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about that. Um, you know that was in I think that's ninety seven, the last year of of your school. Um, at the age of eighteen, you gave birth to Kiyotama, uh, who's actually grown up to become an artist himself. Um, you know, and and we'll we'll talk a little bit more about the effect of of motherhood and particularly the struggle of single mother has had on your work a little bit later. But I, I, one of the immediate effects that you kind of pointed out was that you couldn't really go pursue any kind of advanced art education. You had to really kind of go out and start working, right? Um, because you now had another mouth to feed. Well, exactly. So, I mean, at that time, I really was interested in the creative fields and I wanted to do anything I could do that was creative. Um, so I did like a very quick uh, graphic design course. I learned all the apps and kind of just got a job doing um, graphic design. That was like my, my in. Um, and like, as I said, when I was in England, I was doing just kind of sweatshop kind of graphic design for um, Disney. Um, when I came back to South Africa, I was doing more of like ma magazine design and stuff. But my friend and I started a design company called Matt Black, 
Mike Saul, and uh, that was actually doing really well. We were represent, we were doing a lot of illustration work and also finding illustration work for other people, and we started doing really well and like getting um, good pitches and, and briefs from like um, from like good companies, well, like big companies, should I say? Um, and then we both just kind of realized it really wasn't what we wanted to do at all. Like I did not want to be doing like corporate work, so um, we're like okay, you know, I thought. I'm just going to put everything into my art, like, and surely if I put the amount of time into my own art that I would put in at a nine to five job, like eventually something's going to happen. Right. Like, so that was kind of the turning point for me where I was just like, I had, you know, and in the beginning it was a bit of compromise for sure. I had to take on jobs I didn't want to do, uh, for quite a while, but, um, I was, you know, I was really adamant that, um, that it was possible and that I, I could just like teach myself. Well, and, and I've read you actually say something that I found really inspiring, which was that you wanted to lead by example. Um, you know, you, you have, you have this son now that you're now responsible for, and you did, you wanted to set a good example of not just settling on a menial day job, but instead wanted to continue to pursue your passion for the arts to set a good example for your son. Right. Well, exactly. Right. Yeah. I mean, how can you tell your child to reach for their dreams when you're not reaching for yours, right? So right. <laughs> I guess that that was definitely a part of it. But um, also just for my own sanity, I think um, I just I don't think I would be able to handle um, a different life. I think I, I kind of need that um, independence. Um, it's just who I am. And early on, because like you said, you, you effectively had two full-time jobs and you're, you're taking care of your son. How did you balance that time? Like, how did you manage to make time for everything? Yeah. I mean, I think my twenties were, um, you know, a lot of my friends were kind of partying and having fun and I did do that too, but I also worked really, really hard and, um, was kind of, you know, I think what happened also was that um, I kind of felt that people thought like, oh, you know, you had your child so young, you're not going to, you're going to have, you like, you've ruined your life or whatever. And I just was like, no, like, I actually have power over my future and I'm going to prove it to everyone and to myself that, um, you know, you can create your destiny. So um, that was really uh, an intentional thing. It wasn't by default, like it wasn't by mistake um, that I kind of put my mind to to it. But um, yeah, I mean, I think I often think of it like that I kind of grew up in public in a way, like I educated myself in public because when I look at my earlier works from that time and even like uh, you know, the more transitional works where I was kind of moving more into like st- street art stuff. Um, you know, a lot of it's like quite naive. And, um, you know, at one point I was like really embarrassed about some of it, but like, it, you know, cause it's, it's really, uh, I just put my work out there in public, like from, from the start, like there was no like, um, like maybe like point of like keeping it in and then bringing out when it's ready i was just like i'm ready this is ready i'm doing this and it's very public like diary almost you know yeah it really is and it's interesting and i think um that's what i like about the graffiti culture is very diy and it's it's very just like kind of um doesn't doesn't always ask for permission you know it just right. does what it does and i think that was kind of a attitude i had from um, from the start, which, you know, and sometimes it needs a bit of revision, but, um, that's just what happened. And it taught me lessons in ways that I probably wouldn't have learned if I'd gone to art school or learned the traditional way. But, um, it's funny because it's come full circle. So now I'm learning a lot of the traditional methods and techniques and, uh, ways of articulating what I want to say in ways that are more like contemporary and that. But, um, I've come up but to that um, just really in a very organic and different way. Yeah, it seems very, very organic. Um, and, and when you were first starting out um, and a lot of the graffiti work that you're doing, I'm guessing a lot of that was unsanctioned. Uh, you know, you weren't getting like permission to, to paint a lot of the stuff early on. Um, what was Cape Town's position on graffiti? Did they, they embrace the work that you were doing or did you face a lot of resistance? Yeah, there's always the the city of Cape Town is ultra conservative in terms of its governance, um, and they're very much um, uh, interested in keeping things looking good and 
uh, keeping the actual reality of what's going on in the city under the carpet. Um, I think they're quite notorious for this. Um, so um, the graffiti falls and, and that they, they f it falls under that. We have never really had any support from the city itself, which is quite sad because I know and I've been to cities where it, it works in the opposite way and uh, has actually been really beneficial for both artists and the city. Uh, so I never felt... Um, I never felt any support from the city uh, government, but I did feel a lot of support um, uh, from from some of the community there. You know, is is the street art community there pretty rich? I mean, did did you have a strong community uh, atmosphere? Not really. the The graffiti world there, you know, it's it's kind of traditional still to this day, um, and it it didn't really have the same kind of. Um, evolution as a lot of other cities moving more into like the muralism i think it's just a much grittier harder country uh, for that to really exist in some ways you know like um but for me i think the the key was really the internet you know i was sitting there feeling very alienated for a very long time and um like creatively alienated uh and what really saved me were some of the early like blogs and websites like Worcester Collective and that, that, um, I could see what was happening in like Sao Paulo and, uh, you know, in like different, different countries like all over the world. And, um, that was interesting to me. So I started to kind of communicate with that world. And from about 2006, I was getting invited, like, it was just like a snowball effect to the point where I was, traveling um at one point you know i had to come back i had to really balance it because i was also had my son so i was like doing at some points like two weeks abroad two weeks back or a week abroad a week back with like really long international flights it was pretty <laughs> wild but um yeah so it was a bit of a gypsy and still is a bit of a gypsy life that i kind of took on so at, at what point did it did start to shift? And, and was it that 2006 um, kind of transition? At what point did it shift from unsanctioned kind of work that you were doing under the dark of night into more, quote unquote, legitimate, you know, sanctioned work? Yeah, I mean, um, quite early on in, in some ways, because it was fairly easy in, in Joburg or Cape Town to, um, you know, you just go and speak to people and ask them for their walls and then paint them. It's like you don't have to, you know, uh, it's, it's quite easy to um, do sanctioned work. But uh, it's always been a strong ethos of mine to have um, kind of self-initiated projects. And I try to make sure still today that I, I do at least one or two a year uh, projects that are um, completely just self-funded and self-inspired, like, you know, not commissioned, because I think that keeps the fire kind of burning and it keeps you realizing why you're doing things as well, you know, and like abandoned spaces and just interesting um, explorations. I think that's very much part of my practice still today. Well, and I'm sure it's more fulfilling just from you as a, as a person doing work that you want to do rather than doing other people's work. Yeah, I mean, that's always the ultimate aim is to get to the point where even when you're doing work for other people, it's the work you want to do because people come right. to you for the work that you do. I mean, I think I am at that point now in my career. Um, I tend not to take anything I don't really want to do. Um, that's, the, the, that's the kind of thing you aim for, for sure. For, for sure. And, and have you seen the perceptions e either? It doesn't sound like Cape Town's changed a lot as far as their perceptions towards street art, but just in general, as you've traveled the world, have you seen perceptions towards street art, urban art, public art change over the years? Well, you know, personally, I'm not really fond of the category and um, I don't even like what's going on most of the time when I look at it as a, as a uh, one, uh, con like one movement if you want to call it that because what i see is just very um there's no um there's no real glue there's no manifesto there's no ethos there's no specific style there's you know that there, there's levels of art like on on such different levels and techniques and qu and quality you know so you can't really put it under this umbrella but it does get put on an umbrella but what i the way i see it is i'm more interested in following specific artists that i've been following for years or that i see that are are um, exemplary you know and and seeing where they're going because a lot of the artists that i know who started 
about when I started out, like there's, you know, there's key people who've uh, been able to explore and, and move beyond this uh, kind of uh, box of um, whatever you want to call it, street art, but um, are not doing sculpture and multidisciplinary work, multidisciplinary plenary work that's um, super interesting. So for me, that's where I'm interested. I'm interested in what's coming after and who are those people who are doing this kind of um, new groundwork. That's, that's amazing. Um, and so you know, early on, you, you obviously had to continue doing the graphic design work, illustration work, just to supplement your income from a logistical perspective. At what point were you able to kind of let that go and focus entirely on your own? Yeah, I mean, it's been a good many years now. Um, I don't know exactly date-wise when that would be. I mean, I think 2010, I was doing the Freedom Charter series. I was pretty self-sufficient then already. Um, yeah, I, th- I guess it's a gradual process. But, you know, I'm really grateful for those uh, beginning years because, for instance, now if I'm designing a book or something, it's very easy for me to uh, work within different realms of design. and I- I'm not limited to just, like, knowing how to paint canvas or something. You know, I can. I feel like I, I branch out quite um, easily into different mediums. And I I feel like I don't have a lot of those barriers of, um, of, yeah, like just learning new technical things to support what I want to know. Right, right, for sure. Um, You mentioned in 2006, you sort of started on, uh, your bio refers to it as a nomadic journey, um, which I think is a good way to to, to describe it. Um, what, What prompted that, I guess, decision to go on the road? Was it because you weren't seeing, I mean, you sort of described it earlier how, you know, a lot of your inspiration came from looking outside of Cape Town and the stuff that's going on around the world. Was that really what drove you to also kind of move out? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, yeah, my inspiration definitely came from being in South Africa, um, but I felt like perhaps my expression was, um, yeah, I think I wanted to expand out of South Africa. Uh, well, actually, I wanted to go traveling from a very young age. Um, I remember when I fell pregnant that one of my ideas was to like go backpacking through Africa with my son. And then when obviously um, I realized what motherhood actually meant, <laughs> that wasn't such an easy option anymore. Uh, but when I got the chance to start traveling, I jumped at it because, I mean, I'm, I've just very inquisitive and uh, I think that traveling and seeing other places uh, it just takes you out of your, um, your preconceived habits and you can kind of shed parts of you that you think were you but actually they were uh, just part of your upbringing or the, the, the country that the society like the ways of society of a place that you grew up and the ways of thinking or the food that people eat and uh, way they treat each other or whatever so uh, for me it was like a really great way to like really analyze who I was in the world first of all um, and you know I've always felt a little bit displaced um, even just being a white South African there's a lot of collective baggage you take on from your um, you know your heritage um, and I felt in some ways um like kind of a little bit lost and so that's something that's stuck with me and I think it's not a great feeling but at the same time what's good about it is that you are able to um you're able to kind of start to feel a bit more connected to different places and to the earth itself and I started to see a lot of similarities uh just in human behavior and and you who people were in different places that I traveled, you know, and just, um, yeah, I love, I love being on the road. <laughs> I do want to ground down at some point, but you know, at the moment we are actually just absolutely nomadic. Um, so this is just, I guess it's just the path for the time being. Well, and what, what was the nature of the the projects that you were, were given, uh, you know, early on that, that, that got you out of South Africa? Were they commissioned pieces that, that people were just inviting you to other parts of the world? Yeah, a lot of them were mural projects, so like site-specific uh, murals. Um, some of them were more like gallery shows and things like that. Um, more recently, I've been a lot more picky about the kind of projects I want to get involved in. In the beginning, I was uh, really just interested on the places I was going to, you know. So I, you know, um, gosh, yeah, it's been such an incredible journey to be able to, you know, go from like, Madagascar to London on the same, you know, flying from one place 
couldn't be more different from each other. And you're just getting this complete, um, you're like on the back of a bus going on these hilly roads with chickens under your, um, under your seat. And you've got, you're like car sick and there's like children vomiting in the front or something. And you've been on this crazy <laughs> adventure in Madagascar and you get on a plane and then you're in London on a tube and everybody's like, gray face not looking at each other and you're just like what is this world like you know and this idea that everything is like really really close to each other this idea that you can jump on a plane and you can be on that place that you see on tv that you think is so far away from you but actually it's not um so that for me was so interesting this kind of like um accessibility you know and 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 that's such a privilege right because a lot of people don't have that and i was really lucky to be able to have those invitations that were bringing me to all these places. Are there criteria that you have for, for things that you will or won't do as far as projects go? I know you said early on it was more location motivated, but more recently, do you have criteria that kind of goes into that? Well, right now, you know, I'm, I think, I think I've evolved a lot and matured and there's certain things I'm really interested in, uh, interested in learning and doing. Uh, I'm really interested in kind of uh, doing projects that will allow me to, um, work in the mediums that I'm interested in at the moment. So right now I'm, I've been learning sculpture and I'm interested in perhaps like going to places where I can learn more about sculpture and perhaps show sculpture um, or immersive work. So we did like a project in Sweden where we made a hologram of the moon in the forest and that was like an immersive piece that we could take people to. And I'm interested in uh, showcasing like video works. And um, so... Last year, we did take on a mural project in Cincinnati, but then we were like, okay, but we want to do a projection mapping on this wall. So then we brought my um, pers- uh, my good friend who I collaborate with, Inka Kenzia. So we brought her over and we did the projection mapping. So um, it's really, um, you know, is it is it interesting and beneficial for both parties? I'm not that interested in doing um, the kind of mural festivals that much anymore um i think that's nice in some ways for younger artists and but i also feel that some of those uh need to be a little bit perhaps better curated and and uh, community participation sometimes because you're working in very um you know uh environments where people live and you have to be considerate of this and so yeah i worked with mural arts last year in philadelphia and i loved working with them because They've been in the community for years and years and years, and they do a lot of really, really good uh, work out there. Um, and they do a lot of co- community participation. And for me, that was really great project. When you, when you do go into a community to, to work on a project, do you have a chance to, is there an opportunity to get to know those communities and the people there? I mean, ideally, one should. I, I've definitely... Um, made mistakes in the past and i've definitely learned a lot from from those experiences um but yeah i try to make work that is um, relevant to an area like when i was in india we did i did a series of uh, street paintings that was lotus flowers you know and i felt that those fitted in with the kind of symbolism i was trying to portray within the environments but also within the context of um the culture there, which is, you know, a symbol that's very well known and understood. So um, one does try to be relevant. But I think this is also why I also really love my studio practice, because, um, you know, there's a certain intimacy and um, space for finding uh, ways of speaking that uh, sometimes public art is quite difficult in, in that way, you know. No, for sure. Yeah. And, and so you know, all the traveling that you've done ever since 2006 up until, I guess, like you said today, um, at, at, you're with your responsibilities as a mother. Have you found that difficult to be on the road all the time? Um, or has Kia had a, had a chance to spend time with you on those trips? It takes a village to raise a child. And uh, my son is uh, no longer a child. So um, he's an amazing artist himself and um, working independently. Um, you know, his father is incredible, also an artist, tattoo artist. And, um, he, you know, we, we've, he's just been part of a big community of like, our friends and family who are all creative and 
deeply thinking people. So uh, I just um, did, I have definitely done my best. But um, yeah, uh, he did start traveling from about the age of 15 with me quite a bit. So he got to see a lot of places and, and see some, some interesting projects too from that age. That's amazing. I can only imagine, um, you know, however much of a rewarding experience that has been for him as well. Um, so, you know, you mentioned that you were still on the road. Um, didn't you move to LA for a brief period of time, like in 2017? Or is that not, or are you not living in LA anymore? We uh, managed to get green cards, my son and I. So we moved over. Um, it's been three years and I was based in Los Angeles. Uh, and just recently, um, with the COVID situation, uh, like many other people, I just, like my whole year's plans kind of did a weird 360. And it also threw me off balance a lot, just in terms of um, it made me question a lot uh, what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, who I'm doing it for, um, you know, some really deep questions about my practice, which has been really good. Uh, but what it did was it just made me feel like I want to be away from the city for a while. And um, so I decided to leave Los Angeles and we're just um, kind of slowly going up the Northern California, like little cabins and things. And being in nature, I think for a while, might spend a bit of time in Oakland, but um, no international travel this year. So it actually feels quite good to just um, slow down. You know, like I, I've, I, I started studying actually I'm, I've been studying I decided I'm gonna take some time out to really just like work on my skill level and um, also just think about like how I want to what I want to do moving forward and just take a bit of a, um, a repose to kind of re reset um, so that's kind of what's happening right now and I'm, I'm grateful for that time and I'm grateful to be able to do that you know because I know a lot of people are in really difficult situations right now so yeah we're making the best of it well and it's amazing that in the, in the face of so much you know difficulty i mean across the board just so much bad stuff going on that you're able to kind of find a good side to that and and help your own self kind of grow and evaluate your own purpose well it was something i've been thinking about anyway um i worked really 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 hard the last two years like non-stop and um you know, I had my my reasons for doing that. And I think I, I had my solo show planned on the 1st of April in Cape Town. And I, it was a week before I was supposed to fly. And when all this stuff started happening. And um, so that was very stressful, just like figuring out, like, you know, at that, that point where you're like, is this really as bad as they say? Like, should we cancel the show? Right, and then the right. next day you're like, oh, we better cancel the show. But maybe I'll still go and visit my mom and everyone. And then you're like, the next day you're like, oh, the flights are all canceled. Like, you know, just like this. And I had a, a breakup at the time. So it was just like so much stuff happening. Um, but I think, um, yeah, it, it, is, it takes a bit of time to absorb what's going on, you know? Uh, and then... Yeah, what are you going to do with that? Right, right. Do you do you think you'll go back to LA at some point, or is that something you're going to determine at the end of this kind of road trip that you're on? Yeah, I struggled with LA a lot, um, especially in the first two years. But as I was leaving, I started to really enjoy it, which is funny. Um, so I think I I could possibly go back, but um, we'll see. I I I've also think that. Portugal and Spain and Italy sound really amazing and they have like kind of older cultures and older buildings and uh, a lot of nature and, and that appeals to me a lot so I'm not um, totally sure what, what will happen. <laughs> well I figure it out as you go I guess. Um, yeah. So you know during that worldwide journey that you've been on um, you know in addition to creating street street art pieces and and video pieces and, and some of the stuff that you described earlier you also started showing in galleries for the first time. Um, you know at what point did you start engaging with galleries and how did you first establish some of those relationships? So I was doing printmaking with David Crit printmakers in Johannesburg and uh, I did a solo show with them. That was my first solo show in 20, 2012. Is that right? 2012, yeah. And um, from there, I did a solo in London, 2014, New York, 2015. Yeah, so um, for me, 
I'm really interested in, in working more in gallery museum spaces, in finding a kind of stronger ways to kind of articulate what I want to talk about. And, uh, you know, we've, we've been working in some like wall hangings, tapestries of deconstructed um, maps and money. And, um, I'm, you know, I'm interested in talking about uh, notions of immigration and power structures. And uh, one of the topics I also want to, well, I do speak about in some of my shows is like, the concept of value, you know, monetary value or uh, projected value of objects, the things that we discard, trash, like how is trash um, kind of a mirror of ourselves? You know, what are we throwing away? Not just uh, physically as objects, but also, um, you know, in our societal structures and our family and our friend, like what are we valuing? Like what do we spend time on? Uh, I find that uh, working in the kind of white cube space quite interesting because you really can find like uh, different ways of of speaking. I do see it as a language. Like I do see whenever I explore a new medium, I find I'm like, oh wow, when I'm working in like this video format in black and white, I can really speak like it, it, it feels like a different dialect, you know. And a lot of it is, uh, you know, I really want to speak to the heart. Like, I'm really interested in communicating with people, like, directly, like, somewhere that shifts something uh, for for someone or resonates really deeply. And so any way that I can find that helps me do that um, is interesting. So so even though the, the language is effectively different across all these different mediums, are your goals um, pretty, you know, in the... Are your goals the same, I guess, between, you know, all the different mediums that you do? Um, like, is, are, is the gallery work and the video work effectively extensions of all of the other types of work that you do? I think so. I mean, um, so, for instance, I, um, like some of the video installations I've done are, they're like more, more immersive and experiential. Not like I didn't make them thinking that they would be for sale. I just made them thinking, oh, how would this feel to sit here and see this uh, conglomeration video of atom bombs on these torn curtains that are kind of moving, you know, for instance. Like, that was the initial thought. So, um, but then, of course, um, you know, I guess you have to find that balance of, like, um, making it financially viable and also making the work you really want to make. And... um, yeah, so that's always a bit of a like a an interesting space to navigate. Um, ideally, one shouldn't have to think about those things, right? Right. Uh, right. You should just be purely make whatever you want to make. But often, it's the stuff that um, that you're doing a lot. Like for instance, the paintings of animals that I was doing a lot of, um, especially at one point. Um, like within urban environments and that and I was doing a lot of uh, paintings as well like those were selling really well you know but um, I I just stopped doing them because it wasn't interesting for me after a while I wanted to do other things Um, but I still get requests for those (laughs) but it's like no actually I want to make these weird tapestries out of like banknotes that are sewn together (laughs) so it's almost like you kind of have to like well, educate your audience slowly on, on the new work you're making, but also perhaps like speak to a different audience sometimes who's more interested in that kind of work. Um, yeah, that's something that's, that I've been trying to navigate and kind of understand too, because possibly the audience that I originally, or the people that I originally was speaking to, um, I don't know. It's like, it's interesting. Well, I mean, so, some, some of those people almost certainly will follow you, right? I mean, e- even if, um, you know, th- they're along for the ride, I feel. But then you'll also pick up all new people that you may have not had at the table before. I guess so. I mean, I've always, uh, it's always been the most, uh, one of my, I guess one of my loves for public art is that it's accessible. Like, that's very, very important to me. And I love that. But um, that's also not the only motivating factor because I love painting in, like, weird abandoned spaces where nobody's going to see the work as well because just for the experience of it so i'm not against um making work that's for like 
you know, a commission for, for one person and I think it's going to be meaningful for them. That's, that's, that's good enough too sometimes. So, um, yeah, I do like the idea of the audience expanding or, or changing. Audience sounds like a strange word, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> I guess just like who you're communicating with, you know? Right, right. Do you, do you like the variation that kind of going back and forth between the gallery world, the, the, you know, public art world, do you like that variation? Um, like, do you sometimes need break from one in favor of the other? Yeah, I love it. I mean, and I wouldn't just say the two, just even, um, for instance, going into printmaking and just going into that world and just learning all these new ways of working and mark making that is so foreign, you know, because when you're doing printmaking, uh, the mark you make is not the mark you get. So you have to actually, the process of the printmaking is part, partially the artist, right? The tools themselves have their own mark that influence the final work. So uh, I think what happens is that when you go into a new medium, you kind of learn all these new um, peculiarities and those inform the other work that you're doing. So it kind of keeps the inspiration and the learning process going throughout um but yeah I, like i said I, lately i started doing some painting classes again be, well again i've never really done any before where i was just like i've learned to paint totally by myself and uh, probably doing a lot of things wrong and maybe i should just like go a little bit back to basics so uh but i i've been studying under axel void who's uh i'm not sure if he's familiar with him but he's a good friend of mine and he's really 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 good uh it feels good to just humble myself too sometimes to um you know try and get better <laughs> no for sure i mean but i guess going back you know like what is wrong like you said uh, you know i could be doing things the wrong way what is wrong really i mean it, it's the way that you want to do it so <laughs> put it this way <laughs> When I started doing big murals, I would just try and figure it out, you know, okay. like I had no idea about like a grid system, or whatever. I literally figured out how, how to use a grid system by myself. Like I would fold the paper and I'd be like, oh, try and map it out on the wall. Like it took me, like, I remember just being in tears because you're doing like a four story building and the proportions wrong and like, you know, oh, I've got to come up with a better way and just like slowly figuring things out. And um, it takes a long time to like get to quite simple processes that someone could have maybe just told you, you know. But um, but then I guess you, you also really, really understand them eventually. Uh, but no, I think there's always, um, oh, I think it's amazing to study. I think it's, it's fantastic. I think we should always keep studying. And, and I think uh, something like art is one of the wonderful things that you can study yourself just read and watch films and documentaries and you know like practice and put put the time in and you can just learn so much no for sure um so so i want to shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the common themes in your work which we've already sort of talked a little bit about already um but one of the the common themes that's really prevalent throughout pretty much the entirety of your of your career has been um the woman figure or feminism and and you yourself are sort of this model of feminine strength, you know, being a mother, being a pioneer in a male dominated community, um, you know, is presenting femininity in your work and, and serving as a strong feminine presence in, in the art community, something that's important to you and something that you really, you know, think about. Sure. I mean, I'm, I believe in equality, uh, whether that's male, female or, or, um, race, racial equality, uh, basic human rights, you know, for everyone uh seems so simple right right yeah you would think so <laughs> <laughs> you'd think so um i don't think uh, when i think about like uh, feminine energy i don't always think of it in terms of gender i think of it in terms of kind of energetic energy and i think the world has for a very long time been dominated by this male gaze this masculine kind of force um, and it's been very destructive and i think it's very closely linked with ecology and um, our relationship to the planet i think it's uh, very deep um, so it's not just about uh, gender equality but it's about um intuition it's about empathy it's about um qualities of the feminine that are also in men that just need to be kind of um perhaps um honed a little more in society i think we're very out of balance right now it's very evident <laughs> yeah yeah 
So, um, yeah, I'd like to be part of that um, movement, you know, that helps healing rather than um, breaking. Well, and I think so much of your work really demonstrates and, and preaches those messages. And I, I think it's, I, it was important that, I, I, you know, we highlight that because I think that's amazing. Um, have you seen any kind of shift in the number of, of female street artists over the years? I mean, for me, it's not really just something that you'd look at in street art, but probably in contemporary art and all forms of art and um, many professions too, right, that it's a little out of sync. Uh, there's reasons for that besides just gender. Like, um, yeah, that's debatable whether, like, how exactly those, those, um, those imbalances are formed. Uh, but I do think that having um, females in some of those roles that you can see and admire from a young age helps to believe that it's possible. You know what I mean? Like if you're young and you see somebody like in a position um, that's a female that you admire, then that makes it accessible to you. It's not something that's like, oh, I can't do that. Yeah. Um, so I think that's important. I mean, I really appreciate some of the few female mentors I had growing up and there weren't that many to be honest so um, I do think it's something we need more of. How do you go about I mean the I, I totally uh, agree with the idea of you know let's let's provide inspiration for the kids um, but that's a long game that's multi-generations right to get make things better so how do you how do we make things better sooner um, is it putting people into positions of influence um, is it being more accepting of the feminine energies like what what do you think is a way that we could get there more than just 100 years from now well i think it's really important to still think 100 years from now and i think that's part of our problem uh is that we're not uh you know what's it that what's it called the seven generation thinking it's um kind of an old as what i understand it's an old native way of thinking where you're actually considering seven generations down when you make decisions um but uh yes i just think um just go for it really you know i i've never felt like um held back by gender but what what it has done in some ways i guess has made me want to really make sure my work is good so that i'm uh showcasing something of, of a really high standard rather than um you know leaning on being a female or whatever but there's a lot of boys clubs for sure and i've seen that and i've been in them many times and sometimes it's very subtle and it's not like intentional and it's not because people want to be exclusive or exclude exclude certain demographics but uh you see it and and um definitely um in the street art kind of world if we're going to talk about that um i'd say it's also quite a white male world right. um and it's not necessarily that that was intended by anyone but i do think it's something that people should consider and maybe the curators should make a little bit more effort in being more um you know bringing in a bit more diversity when you say curators do you mean like the the street art festival cur curators or yeah gallery curators and um yeah just people who are planning projects should maybe look a little broader than what they normally are. Right. No, I totally agree. Um, another common theme in, that, you, that you mentioned earlier are animal figures, especially in your earlier works, not as much uh, nowadays. Um, but what role historically have animals played in your work? Is there sort of a symbology to that um, in the way that you're conveying your message? Yeah, I think that I'm interested in the kind of archetypal nature of animals. So what do they represent within the human psyche, like symbolically? Uh, that's interesting to me. So I often do think of them in that ways, more as these kind of spiritual totems um, or familiars. Uh, and then also just uh, kind of looping back to what we were talking about earlier of um, the natural world and our disconnection to it and um, bringing in um, these creatures and sometimes mythical creatures that um, we feel disconnected to. I mean, I've also got the series of like moons and, uh, you know, more just things that uh, make you look up at night at the sky instead of down at the tarmac. <laughs> right. <laughs> really, you know, like bring a little bit of magic into your day to day. Like you're walking down the street in LA, like you're near Skid Row and then you see these like big horses, like, um, I mean, yeah, so I think I'm interested in bringing a little bit of magical realism into people's environments. 
No, that's that's fantastic. And and I know one of the pieces that you did in Harlem, um, not only did that, but it also preached a, a very important message about um, sort of uh, immigration and the global nature of of humanity. You know. So that's the the birds kind of all morphing into each other in a circular manner. Yeah. So uh, immigration's always been migration and immigration has always been an interesting uh, thematic for me, and it's it's um, come up a few times um, in some of the tapestries we're doing, but also in uh, we did a performance piece called Aurum, which was very heavily based on. Uh, um, this kind of imagery of an idea of animals having access to the planet naturally, you know, right. like migration is a totally normal thing for the animal world. And we are animals. And to see the world as cut up with these rulers and pens by these uh, colonizers, you know, who raped and pillaged and decided that this is going to be a border and you need a piece of paper to cross that. Like this kind of thinking that we think is normal is actually not, um, necessarily a natural way of thinking. So, um, yeah, that's something that I do think about and speak about sometimes too. And I think having had the ability to travel so much, I understand what a privilege that is. I mean, when I speak to my American friends or my friends in Europe, they don't have any clue how hard it is to travel for most people coming from like uh, developing nations, you know, like, um, being having a South African passport, for instance, or perhaps other African passports, like to get a visa for Europe, like it's not an easy thing to do to go on a holiday, even with the currency exchanges. Um, so um, having access to the world is a privilege, uh, but it shouldn't be, you know. And and the way that uh, immigration is so uh, cruelly looked at in many places. Um, People are unable to see themselves in other people's positions, it seems. Um, and this kind of really lack of understanding, of, of empathy, of, of what it's like to be that person who's displaced. Yeah. I mean, this is like really heavy stuff. And it's something I'd like to get more into, perhaps a bit more seriously in my work. Um, but I think it's something we have to talk about more because um, it's probably going to get worse. You know, this us and them thinking, red and green zones. Um, of the world it's definitely seems to have gotten that mentality it seems to be spreading like I mean, it's, you know you'd only see pockets of it around the world but now it's like every country has some kind of a you know uh, i don't know fascist leader that's that's promoting these dangerous ideas it's just unbelievable i mean i think a lot of us have been taken by surprise at the strength of this kind of polarization but i think it's by design to be honest especially in places like america where you see that the you know this kind of two-party system where actually i think we know that the real powers are probably behind both of them and it's like the situation where you get the idea that you're voting and yeah. you're having this kind of powerful vote but actually you probably like of course trump is worse but you know how much better is the other option yeah. so um what where was i going with this oh just this polarization like um it's very worrying and instead of um the, the leaders so-called leaders trying to like unify people they're actually trying to separate them more and i think it's really this age-old divide and conquer um, theory, right? If the people are divided, it's much easier to rule. And if people are uneducated, that's the, that's the other thing. People have been dumbed down uh, through uh, through TV and media and the education system for generations now. So, like, you, you're not dealing with um, very educated population, which is very dangerous too. So I think, um, unfortunately, I think that it's by design. And I think people, in order to wake up, have to really start to self-educate and uh, self-educate their kids properly, you know, and like maybe rethink these uh, institutions that are not actually beneficial. No, it's definitely, um, it's definitely frightening and something that I think things like this pandemic only expose even more broadly, you know. Um, one, one of the things you talked about earlier that, that has had a large presence in your work for a while now is abandoned spaces and this idea of, um, you know, abandoning things that used to be cherished, uh, the landfill meditation series that you did, for instance. Um, what is your own fascination with abandoned spaces? And, and I know you've referred to them as sacred. Uh, and why do you love painting them as much as you do? 
Yeah, um, the Landfall Meditation series was quite close to me. I f the whole fascination with abandonment, uh, with this, this architecturally, the spaces are incredible for me. First of all, like urban exploring is just, um, for me, such a beautiful way of exploring a city. But, um, and you know, there's a lot of memory and character and like texture in these spaces um, that you can just, it's visceral, you can like feel it, it's thick in the air. But um, besides that, I'm, you know, the Aqua Regalia series was also installations made of found objects, like discarded objects and like creating these kind of shrine-like installations from them. So I think the thing is, it's not just about the objects that are discarded or the architectural spaces or the old factories that, that become defunct because of notions of progress, but um, um, it's about also like i think we were talking about it earlier really it's just like um really considering what it is that we value and i think that our value systems are off uh, you know i've always had a deep sense of that or i had a deep sense of that growing up in south africa because i felt like something was off like i could feel it was off like it wasn't right like i couldn't quite understand what was happening but i, I knew it you know and that made me quite rebellious um and so i still feel it i feel like our you know the way we use plastic so like um, you know, and I'm to blame. I'm not like coming, I'm not coming at this like everybody's wrong. Like I'm totally part of this as well. Um, but our, our systems are completely, um, wasteful. And so the landfall meditation series was, uh, you know, we used the symbol of the, like the abandoned derelict uh, car, which is a symbol of, of kind of consumerism and progress and the American ideal, you know, like this having the car, uh, but, but, uh, like, but looking at the, this car that's been disposed of, uh, that's, that's worn down. Um, so it's this idea of trash, of, of assimilating it into our, like our shadow. You know, I'm very into Jungian psychology. I'm a bit of a nerd with that. And I really, um, this idea of shadow integration. So, uh, when you are, when you know that there's something wrong, but you push it away, it becomes very dysfunctional and you can kind of, come up with all these like neurosis in your psychology but if you really want to like come to individuation or like a uh, wholeness you have to look at your shadow so you gotta like kind of interrogate your dreams like interrogate the dark spots that you're kind of like ignoring so i think physically it's um how much trash are we throwing out like what is this waste you know what are these things we're discarding what's the value in them like maybe we can fix them and reuse them like maybe there's other ways of living um it really ties into like that kind of thinking, I guess. And and how do you find, um, you know, when you're traveling for a show, I mean, when you're traveling to do projects, how do you find these abandoned spaces? You mentioned said urban exploring. Do you, do you make time to go out and look for these types of spaces? Yeah. I mean, it's not just me. I guess I have friends who are into these weird things too. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, yeah, when I travel, I'm, I try to, well, I mean, I just, I would never go on like a tourist bus, you know. My tourist bus is like my contacts there and they're usually into doing some urban exploring too. And, or, you know, like we're just, that's just how we roll. Well, does that sort of tie, tie back to getting to know the community? We, we, we talked about that very early on. Um, um, I mean, maybe. It's, you get to know the fabric of a space for sure. To be honest, I don't do it that much in America because I'm a little bit scared of people and their guns and the cops here. Whereas in Europe, it's pretty chill. South Africa, you got to be careful of like gangsters and like who might be living there. Um, sometimes we've had to like hire security to come with us in those spaces. So it depends where you are. Like you have to be quite streetwise. You don't just walk into an abandoned space, you know. Uh, you kind of have to think about what you're doing a little bit first. But um, yeah, I think there's something about, um, you know, I have a, uh, another thing that I've been doing my whole life, which is just documenting uh, walls like graffiti but also like um, drawings from stowaways under bridges and gang graffiti or like when you go into a lot of these abandoned bu buildings especially like I think uh, early on it began in Johannesburg because there's a lot of abandoned high-rise buildings in Johannesburg because of the history of the city and a lot of them were kind of buildings that had a lot of people living in them who were then evicted and so there's a lot of writings on the walls and scrawlings and drawings and so I have this kind of obsession with um, like memories of the spaces. 
Okay. Very cool. And, and sort of tangential to that, um, you know, a lot of the work that you've done out in the streets just by its very nature is ephemeral. I mean, you know, buildings get torn down, they get buffed over. Um, how do you feel about that? Is that something that that's concerning to you or do you embrace that tempor- temporariness of, of your work? I don't mind it. I mean, uh, yeah, I think you learn that early on when you're doing public work um, that it ha- it has a temporary nature. I think it's a good practice for, um, you know, the final death where we have to leave everything behind. So you're just good practice letting things go. I mean, even in terms of interpretation, you know, sometimes you might make something with a certain intention, but it's received quite differently. And that's difficult, but you have to allow that to be, like, you know, obviously it's not ideal, but that's just the nature of the world we live in. And one one aspect of, of the, I guess one thing that I'm really fascinated by is the way that you, you will blend your work into whatever surface that it's on, whether it's a building or whether it's a found object that you're painting uh, for a gallery show. It, you know, you tend to make it seem as if the work was always there and it's part of the environment that it's in. Um, is that something that you really put a lot of effort and thought into when you're designing your work? I think that came from, so, okay, so then going back, like when I first started, I was um, really just doing lettering, like graffiti lettering, and I loved that. And I still love like calligraphy and, and line work. But um, really um, what happened was that I started to become really interested in like the environments I was painting in, um, whether it was like a township or like an abandoned factory or just like an alleyway or something. I was interested in like what the texture of the surface I was painting on, like how did my art then like add to that or communicate with that or like how was there a dialogue with that space? Uh, so um, that was something that came really early on and st- was like the beginning of the, I think the transformation of my work. And you find like in a lot of the canvas works or paintings on wood that the textures are often coming from photo references that I've taken of, um, you know, street decay or scrawlings or kind of like the, the mark, the lime marks on the bridges from the water, you know, like that to me is beautiful. And that's like completely made by nature or like urban decay. And, um, that's art, you know, like art doesn't need to be made by a human. <laughs> Well, you have an amazing way of incorporating that into into your work, and I, I really, I really, I'm, it's fascinating to me because you 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 tend to, I guess, um, appreciate the the building or the structure or the the piece of wood that you're painting on. Right. So, like at the taxi ranks, that like don't get cleaned that much. Like the wall's pretty dirty, and like every day there's people walking past this one corner, and their bags knock on it, or like you know maybe somebody scribbles something there, or the rain comes it's like the environmental textures that happen to a like a little corner that you walk past and it's just like oh that's so beautiful like i would never be able to like i would literally look at some of these spaces sometimes and be like i would never be able to make such a beautiful piece of art like that took so much time and just like um you know it's a, it's a, it shows the life of that space and um so for me that's beautiful and i, I, I yeah i do try and incorporate that kind of thing sometimes um, another aspect of the work that, that you've made throughout your career, which we were talking quite a bit about just earlier in, in, uh, as sort of a side topic, um, is the, the feeling of activism that, that you sort of inject into it. You, you're all, you always have a message that, that you're trying to share with the world. Um, and, and I think it's super effective the way that you go about it because, you know, your work is also very beautiful. And so the beauty of, of what you create tends to make it more approachable and brings people in or the message that you're then trying to communicate. Um, is it important to you that you use your platform um, creating art in public spaces or in private spaces just for the world as a way to advocate for the issues that you feel passionate about? Uh, when I started, I think if you look at like the early Freedom Charter series where I took the Freedom Charter and we painted slogans from the Freedom Charter in different locations in South Africa. And um, I think that my earlier work was kind of more overtly uh, message based, um, kind of directly. And then I, I think I'm more interested now in how to, uh, have certain eth- ways of thinking and ethos, but I don't necessarily want to tell people how to think. I'm more interested in help, like being part of the process of thinking for people so that like they might see the work and it might, 
um, affect them emotionally or like um, kind of on a metaphysical level even or, or, or make them think about something slightly differently. Like that to me is more effective. And I do think like the personal is political. So like uh, we affect change on individual level. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's always been important i think growing up in south africa had a massive impact and living my most of my life there i still go back a lot like you know my family's there and some of my best friends um that's it's a place that's very very deep and very close to my heart um i think if you look at like art coming out of south africa most of the like high contemporary art has a strong message in it even if it's not um like direct you'll feel it you'll know there's something very has depth to it and i think that's something the african continent has to offer the world it's been through a lot and there's a lot of wisdom and soul in that continent and if you um i, I really just think that art from africa like uh, and diaspora is like very powerful um so i mean if i could be part of that that would be very fulfilling <laughs> Do you, do you, as far as like what's going on right now in the U.S., are you, are, do you feel that there are lessons that could be learned from what's happened in South Africa and or the other way around? Are there ways that the South African people can learn from some of the activism that's going on here? It's an interesting question. Um, it's just something I've been thinking about a bit, actually, because when, when all of this um, kind of exploded recently, the Black Lives Matter situation, and, you know, I think... People have just been so frustrated with this kind of brutality um, of the police force and the prison system. and um, It's making people really talk about race more and to really reflect on their own. Um, you know, even if you're not overtly racist, doesn't mean that you don't have um, some personal work to do in terms of like perhaps stereotyping and like understanding your role or your history or your family history um these kind of topics are topics that i grew up with and that are very prevalent in south africa um they're not tiptoed around and i feel like in america maybe they have been tiptoed around a bit but in south africa because of the extremity of the situations there like I'm very used to like hearing about this com these conversations. I think it's really important. They're very difficult to have as well. Um, but I'm, yeah, hopefully there will be a lot of change and healing that comes from it. Have you seen the situation in South Africa improve from when you were growing up to today as far as that goes? Um, there's a lot of uh, beautiful um, things happening in South Africa, culturally, musically, art with art, music and fashion, um, uh, youth cultures that are very mixed. Uh, I can say I've seen a lot of incredible stuff that gives me goosebumps, you know, that I, I just can't see anywhere else in the world. But it still has a lot of issues. And I think there's a lot of frustration with the lack of change uh, from the government and um, sometimes also, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of racial tension and, yeah, it's a very complex place. I think um, I've kind of unfortunately got used to the world being really messy. <laughs> and if it's not, I'm surprised rather than the other way around at this point in my life. You know, when I go to Europe or even the first few times I went to Europe, I was just like, it's so strange like to be in a place that's like it kind of works, <laughs> you know. <laughs> It has like this social democracy where they have like free healthcare and education and it's like, oh yeah, there are ways to make things work. It's amazing, right? Like it actually can work. It's not yeah. this terrible thing. I mean, do you find that you're innately hopeful or, uh, you know, even though you have seen so much badness in the world, um, you know, even if you are critical, are there aspects of optimism? I mean, I think it's really, and there's no other choice. I don't think it's whether you believe it or not. I think it's the only way, it's a strategy. And it's a Noam Chomsky quote, actually. I, I, I put it on my wall in Philadelphia. I wanted to pay homage to him because he, uh, he's from Philly. Um, and uh, what's the quote? Um, Optimism is a strategy for a better future. And I think it's um, really just, I think it's the human condition is suffering. You know, if you look at Buddhism and some, the more spiritual teachings. Actually, suffering is a key to um, spiritual growth, actually, when you utilize it. It's not something we can really avoid. Um, 
in the earthly realm. So I do accept that this is where we're coming from. And I believe that like human race has always been kind of awful, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> but at the same time, we're also very beautiful and have this amazing potential for compassion. And, you know, that, um, I have a whole series that is kind of just about this like polarity between, um, our, our, our ability for compassion and, and extreme like our harsh uh, violence yeah so it's not so much about believing in hope but it's more just um you just have to like how else are you going to survive like right. if you just let the stuff get you down it's like i would have this conversation with my friend rafa in cape town and this is like when i was early starting to make work i remember just being like you know, I was reading Noam Chomsky and Naomi Klein. I remember reading Disaster Capitalism, that thick yellow book. And that just spun me into depression, man. It's all about like the CIA and what they did in South America. And like, it's just unbelievable the levels that this goes. And then also uh, the scramble for Africa and like colonization and like how, how awful, like, you know, how awful, what a place we live in. Um, and it's like, how can I like know this stuff and still uh, like have my magical side? How can I still have awe at the universe and like be able to like talk about that? So I think it's uh, a lot of my process has been trying to trying to find this balance. You know, like okay, I'm I don't want to ignore the reality that's happening in the world, and I don't want to ignore like the incredible beauty and like um, radiant wisdom that's in the world either. So like this is quite an amazing place we live in right like and i think um there must be a reason that we're put into this place to kind of try and find our space within it huh try to make it a little bit better than than we came in pretty profound yeah <laughs> you mentioned um the series uh, a minute ago was that the 783 hertz series that you were talking about Yes, exactly. Um, so that series is, well, that, that's named uh, basically based on the frequency of the planet, the, the electrical frequency, which is, um, you know, the, the planet is um, negatively charged, the ionosphere is positively charged, so the thunderstorms and that are basically electrical way of kind of, um, it's like a battery almost, you know, and so the frequency, we're all part of and aware of it and um you know we're electrical beings actually so we're made um we have a charge uh and but all the names on that series are um actually references to wars from the beginning of um recorded history well i guess western i don't know exactly what well, it's a list of wars that i could find i'm sure there's more <laughs> But um, so, but the the images themselves are are very compassionate. So a lot of them are like murals, like the one in Brooklyn, and you know, people kind of hugging, embracing, caressing. Um, so just yeah, playing with this. I like to have these images of compassion in public, right? That's that's nice. You walk down the street and you kind of, you know. Well, and it also I think speaks to the. I guess, universality of the human condition. I mean, these are all things that everybody can relate to, these feelings, right? Right. I saw quite a lot of people posting some of, like, well, especially the Brooklyn one um, during lockdown. And it was kind of sweet for me because everybody's been so isolated. It is interesting, the isolation, because I'm actually quite comfortable with being on my own. I think a lot of artists are. We like our time alone. Like we're not like, we don't need to be around people all the time. But there's a difference between ch uh, choosing isolation and forced isolation. And it really made me realize how just the basic interactions with people are so important. Yeah, that's definitely something I think a lot of people are, are missing right now. And I could see how walking by that mural in particular would be uh, somewhat of a heartening thing. You know? Well, hopefully, uh, I mean, hopefully this time will um, uh, make a lot of people value each other and our interactions more, you know, and just maybe have more uh, authentic interactions with people and, and less vapid ones. That would be nice. That would be a great outcome if, 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 we, could, if we could come out of this whole thing with that. <laughs> you know, just greeting someone, greeting someone when you go to the store right. would be nice. When I moved to L.A., that was a little bit hard for me. Because I felt that the, I felt that the way people um, kind of interacted was a little bit uh, reserved. Mm. Do you have any plans for any more in that seven eighty three hertz series? 
Yeah, and most of my series are like not ending. <laughs> They're just going to keep going. Like in my studio, I have um, so many works in progress, different stages of progress that I kind of pick up at different times. Um, I think when I do an exhibition, I'll kind of focus on one thematic, uh, but um, they're all kind of rolling at the same time because they do kind of interlink and inform each other. They're not just totally isolated. Yeah. And, and so you mentioned this earlier, you do have an upcoming solo show. It was originally scheduled for April, um, you know, right as we were getting into this thing. Um, it's been rescheduled now for 2021. What can you tell about the show? This was the show uh, chant at Ever Reed Gallery. Yeah, I mean, it was like ready to go. I was literally varnishing my last painting. <laughs> um, and then it got postponed till May 2021, which seemed like such a long time away at the time. But now I feel like doing a show this year just wouldn't make any sense. Um, oh, the show chant um, is really, it's about this, um, it's about navigating this onslaught of of things that keep coming our way. So it could be like political, social, environmental. I mean, I guess COVID could be totally one of these things too. We're constantly navigating the news. And it's like, how do you sail? How do you like keep your, how do you keep your ground? How do you keep your balance when you're just having this onslaught of um, uh, situations and effects happening, outside world effects happening to you? Um, it's, it's, it's one of, well, it's definitely the most, um, I think this show is one of the most sh the shows that I've done where I've really made the work I really want to make and I haven't thought about like is this going to sell is this not going to sell you know I've just been like this is what I want to make I'm not compromising and so there's works in there that I feel might be kind of hard for some people to access perhaps perhaps in terms of like buying a beautiful piece for your um your lounge or something but I think perhaps this is what I was talking about earlier is that it's actually maybe for a slightly different audience in some ways in that way uh, because some of it's just a little bit more conceptual and gritty um, but it speaks to a lot of topics it speaks to um, nationalism and it speaks to homelessness it speaks to um, um, kind of war and it, it's quite heavy but I really needed to just it speaks to violence it speaks to gangsterism it speaks to a lot of things um, that I just feel I needed to express well if there's any time for a heavy show it's now I think I mean this has been a heavy year it was quite interesting for me because I um absolutely felt that what was happening now totally fitted in with what I was talking about. Actually, this whole year just feels like almost like a premonition show. The one of the last works we, we finalized is this, um, it's a big deconstruction work. It's about two meters and it's uh, very delicately um, hand-drawn flags of the world, but they're all deconstructed. So they're cut up and like kind of jumbled around. So they're like the whole or national identity of the world, but all mixed together with this kind of uh, unifying circle painted in, in the center. And um, I, I just felt like when COVID happened, I was like, oh, th that's what this artwork was about. This artwork was literally like, I felt like I had downloaded um, COVID, like in a way, like this, um, the way that we were so, um, like the whole world was so affected by this virus to me was um such a interesting look at um at nations and and the connectivity of travel like how something can spread like that and how like no one is immune you know right. and and just this like globalization um so that was really interesting ha has pushing the date out resulted in you making any more work than you originally planned yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, it's probably going to be quite a full show, I guess. I'm kind of, I'm keeping to make, st I'm, I'm keep, keeping making things for the show slowly and gradually, just, um, if I feel like something fits in, uh, I'm, I'm adding a few pieces here and there. Has recent events, I mean, obviously it seemed like you were, um, predicting all of this anyway, but have recent events with COVID and as well as like the protesting, has it affected the nature of the show at all? Um, I, I've been adding a few little pieces. I haven't been making a ton of work. As I said, I've been studying a little bit now. So I've been doing a lot of, um, I, ha I haven't felt ready to quite make, um, 
work directly. I, I feel like I'm still absorbing what's happening. Do you know what I mean? I don't like yeah. to like push myself to make work on a theme until I'm like actually ready. So I haven't, I did make, initially I did do some, uh, drawings on liminality this concept of liminality when you're in a liminal space like like uh it's like a, a rift between two worlds and i felt that was happening so i did some quite large pencil drawings uh thinking about that but that won't be for the chance show very cool but that's for a different show <laughs> <laughs> and I, I know that er, uh, when it was originally planned for april you had it started painting in the streets of johannesburg um the, the text chant around um you know around the city um how does i mean how does that work when you're coordinating with a gallery show like that is that something that you arrange with the gallery or they approach you with or, or what's involved with that Ah, that just shows me how close I was to that show. I mean, we were like literally ready. It's kind of funny. We're doing the chance. uh, Yeah, we did. Well, I have got a series, Leviscera, which is um, a series of text works, which I've always loved text, you know. So um, I like to, I have a font that I developed and I I like to paint specific words in specific places. So the chant uh, slogans were kind of part of a wider series. Uh, But I was in Johannesburg and I just decided I wanted to have this word chant uh, like kind of repeated around the city. So we did that for quite a few days. Um, It was very interesting. (laughs) It was pretty rough and amazing. Um, And so... It was connected to the show, for sure, but the gallery had nothing to do with it. Um, that's just me being me. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned it's in uh, the, the new date is in May. Is there a date set for it? 5th of May. 5th of May. Okay, yeah. very cool. Any other upcoming projects that you'd want to talk about? Uh, really nothing. I, I absolutely cleared my schedule. Um, I have decided that this is not the year for me to be making projects um and that's quite a nice change to be honest um very unusual so um yeah i'm just going to take some time to study and and make work too a bit and check in with myself and um i guess i'll see what happens next year hopefully we'll be able to like travel and and um be more productive next year but I mean, we'll see what happens near the end of the year if things start picking up again. But um, for now, I just I just felt like it's kind of nice to check out for a bit. Very cool. Well, uh, tell people where they can find you online. Sure. Well, my website is faith47.com and faith47 on Instagram. I guess those are the two places I'm most active. And um, yeah. Thanks. That was a very personal interview. It was, uh, I've just told you everything. <laughs> so... Well, I have, I have one last question. Um, and this is something that I like to ask everybody, and this is how I usually close the show out. Uh, who is one artist that you'd like to see me have on the show? Oh, actually, there's a South African artist I'm a little bit obsessed with at the moment. And I love his work so much, but I've never really heard him talk about his experience or motivation for his work. Uh, Singer Samson. Okay. Yeah, he's incredible. Um there's just something very mystical about what he's doing. Uh, I'd love to hear him talk about his journey and what he's making. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Faith, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. I I really appreciate it. And I I really appreciate your presence and voice within the community. Well, thanks so much for inviting me. Yeah, it's been nice. So that's it for this episode of Art Affairs. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Faith. One thing that is impossible to ignore when talking to her is just how deep of a love she has for the human condition and, you know, the universality of what we all experience as humans. Um, What she said about the imbalance in our value system is something that really resonated with me how we'll all too often abandon these things and people that we once cherish, um, and we also, at the same time, hold up and praise these symbols of human progress, yet are inherently wasteful and destructive towards our environment. And then relating human immigration to the migratory activities of animals, highlighting how 
unnatural many of our concepts about globalization have become and how wrong many of the attitudes towards immigration are uh, in this country and in many parts of the world. I just love how full of compassion and empathy she is. And, and you can definitely see that embedded in the DNA of the work that she makes. Um, but I also like how she framed what she felt her role was in making the art that she does. You know, she's not trying to bang you over the head with her message and, you know, change your opinion about a thing, but rather present you with the ideas and encourage you as a viewer to think and experience these ideas, trusting that when you do, you know, truly introspect and reflect on them, only good can come of that. I'm really looking forward to seeing all of the work Faith has been putting together for that chant show at Everard Reed Gallery. It definitely feels like she had some amount of clairvoyance when putting that body of work together, the way she described it. Uh, the show, originally scheduled for this past April, will open on May 5th of next year. So definitely keep an eye out for more information on that. So thanks again to Faith for joining me today, and thank you for checking out the show. I'm truly grateful for your support. If you happen to have Apple Podcasts, rating and reviewing the show is such a huge help. And as always, you can contact me through my website at artaffairspodcast.com or on Instagram at artaffairspodcast. So until next time, be good to yourself and be good to each other. Mm-hmm.